All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the eighth webinar in the Insights Outreach Series hosted by the DHS Science and Technology Office of Industry Partnerships. In this series, we want to help you navigate S&T's partnership opportunities, understand DHS mission needs, and identify paths to funding to help get the best homeland security solutions to market faster. We invite you to join us the first Tuesday of every month for the webinar series. You can find a list of upcoming webinars and recordings of our previous videos on the DHS s and events page. During today's webinar, you will learn how s and works with the DHS operational components to, a, to identify capability gaps and turn those research and development needs into technologies through a variety of funding and commercialization mechanisms. We've invited our partners from the DHS Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office to speak a little later on in the presentation, so you'll hear from them soon enough. And just a little housekeeping, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to put them in the Q&A chat box and we will address them later in the webinar during the Q&A session. With that, I think we're ready to get started. So I will introduce John McEntee, s and Operations and Requirements Analysis Director. John? Thanks, Connie. Um, can we go ahead and go to the first slide, please? Now, one thing I want to do is kind of bring us back uh, to the history uh, of DHS. After the 9-11 tax of 2001, uh, the Homeland Security Act of 2002 sought to unify and integrate 22 federal agencies and departments now, to improve Homeland Security enterprise, thus the creation of DHS. And s and was formed shortly thereafter in March of 2003 uh, to be the science advisor for the Secretary of Homeland Security and to be the R&D arm for the department. Now, s and overall, we provide research, development, test, and evaluation for the DHS operational components to carry out the missions of preventing terrorism, enhancing security, securing and managing our borders, safeguarding and securing cyberspace, and ensuring resilience to disasters. So overall, we do have a cadre, and we recruit top-notch scientists, engineers, and program managers from across the country and across the world to enable rdt &E in a timely fashion uh, to transition capabilities to the Homeland Security Enterprise. Our partnership with the end user community is critical in the success, and our job is to ensure their high priority needs are met. In addition to having R&D appropriations uh, to meet high priority needs from operational components, s and has core and enduring research labs, chemical, biological, transportation, animal disease control, and urban security. We have university-based centers of excellence that align to the department mission sets, technology centers that house our technical subject matter experts. They look at enduring science, sciences, innovative systems, and advanced computing. We also maintain 14 international bilateral agreements for the department. We manage the department's federally funded research and development centers, one of them being the Systems and Engineering uh, and Development uh, Institute, that one's currently being managed by MITRE, and the Homeland Security Operational Analysis Center, currently being managed by RAND. And we also leverage the Department of Energy, Department of uh, Defense partners, on several activities to strengthen Homeland Security. Next slide, please. So we have what we call a blueprint model. And this is the basis which we establish a process within s and to ensure that we perform due diligence, due diligence before we invest in any R&D activities. It's pretty simple. Uh, you First, you need to understand the needs from your component customers. You apply that a deliberate approach and you execute efficiently, effectively. And it's pretty simple at that level, but I think everybody knows there, there's a lot more involved in that. But when we first get a, a, a requirement or a need from a component, it has to be prioritized. And that's why component or customer engagement is critical to our operation because we are all limited by resources that are available. So we have to ensure that we're meeting customers' top priority requirements and also uh, ensuring that we align to the Hill, um, to the White House, 
and our DHS leadership uh, for overall Homeland Security Enterprise priorities. So once you get the, the priority set, you build your requirements uh, with your components and better understanding what is the requirement that we're trying to solve before we invest any of the, the resources. And so after you get the requirements and understanding the who, what, where, why, when, and how, then you have to go and do a market research. This is called technology scouting. So this is something that we do with an s and as part of our core enduring capabilities. We don't wanna reinvent the wheel. What we do is we scan the market, we look to see if there's any commercially available solutions. Um, and we also look at our government partners. Uh, we look at government uh, solutions as well. And, and to see if there's anything that we can leverage to meet our Homeland Security Enterprise customer needs. And then once you scan the market, it gives you the baseline and understanding the state of technology and then where we need to invest further research and development um, to meet those requirements. And then we perform implementation and program management. And this is the longest piece of the investment. But up to that point, we want to have all those discussions and doing our homework and understanding what is available before we uh, invest R&D dollars. And then during that program management phase, it is extremely important that we're thinking transition because our end goal is to deliver capabilities and to our customers. And transition planning has to happen early, often, and throughout the R&D lifecycle. And what's also important is that our customers are involved through that, that, that whole life cycle as well. Next slide, please. And so with that, we have integrated product teams where we consult with our customers because s and we only have R&D appropriations to perform these investments. We don't have the ability to procure and sustain the capabilities once they're done. That is up to the DHS operational components. So you see to the right, all the different DHS components that we serve in the department. These are our customers. These are the ones that will procure and sustain those capabilities once we prove the capability um, can, can work. But what's important is that, again, we work with them throughout the life cycle because DHS, we plan, many years out. And we have to ensure that there's a home for the, the technology before uh, we make those long-term investments. And, um, and the, the components have to wedge the funds or have an existing program of record for the technology to transition to. So we know priorities change. And these IPTs uh, are ongoing. They don't just happen once or twice a year. They're throughout the year. Because as, as threats emerge, priorities change. And we need to be agile enough to make those adjustments and ensure that our end users get the capabilities that they need. And one other thing that I do wanna mention is that um, when we collect the requirements from the components, we also do additional due diligence. If we see common denominators across components, we want to invest in those as well. Those kind of tend to rise to the top because if we see multiple components that have a similar need, that is the best bang for the for our R&D dollar. And, and so those tend to rise to the top. Yes, we want to make sure that we get the components top priorities, but we also want to look at those things that benefit multiple components, those singular R&D investments that have uh, multiple end users. For example, our counter UAS R&D efforts. We currently serve five different component customers. And I think that's uh, fantastic instead of having five individual R&D activities with five different components. We have one core R&D effort where the, the department benefits from the technological state investments for uh, the entire program itself. Next slide, please. And so these are some of the areas uh, that we, we tend to focus investment on. Again, if you see these, these usually are not 
singular specific to components. One of the reasons s and exists is to perform that analysis and look at those and make those investments that create economies of scale and allow us to uh, invest to benefit the entire Homeland Security enterprise as a whole. I mentioned counter US. Biometrics is another one. TSA, CBP, Secret Service. We have a lot of customers, uh, Obum, have a lot of customers in the biometrics realm. And you can say that across all the major investment areas that S&T is doing. And again, instead of having singular R&D activities spread across the department, we have core R&D activities that serve the entire Homeland Security enterprise. And with that, uh, next slide, I believe that's my last slide. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. Um, so everyone, my name is Greg Wigton. I'm the program liaison for the Office of Industry Partnerships, and I'll be your host for today's fireside chat. So thanks, John, for that overview of how s and works to set priorities for DHS s and I'd like to also welcome Dr. Dr. Angela Irvin to join us for a larger discussion on our customer engagement and where we get our requirements. Dr. Irvin is the DHS s and Portfolio Manager for Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction and Acting Portfolio Manager for First Responders. Angela, welcome to today's fireside chat. Would you be able to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role within DHS s and Sure, thanks, Greg. As Greg said, my name is Angela Irvin, and I am the portfolio manager for uh, working with CWMD office, countering weapons of mass destruction, one of our components. First, I'd like to discuss what a portfolio means. Just a level set, a portfolio is a collection of programs, projects, and operations mm -hmm. which are grouped together to facilitate effective management and to meet a customer or component strategic objectives. Portfolio managers have a critical role. They lead, they have the lead responsibility and accountability for component engagement. And John stressed the importance of that to s and Portfolio managers are responsible for leading and coordinating s and IPT engagements with their assigned DHS component and to identify capability gaps or requirements, which are then prioritized and approved by the IPT. So John was showing different steps we take towards initiation of a project. This is step number one. Once we have a list of those high priority projects, the top gaps are inserted into what John mentioned was the blueprint model. Uh, we call it the BPF, the blueprint uh, process flow. These gaps are decomposed by an s and team, which means the portfolio manager and the component supporters of that gap. And an, again, another internal s and team work together to refine the requirement narratives. Let's get down to what we really are asking for. So the gap description, the shortfalls, current shortfalls, benefit if success is realized, metrics, use cases, et cetera. Then the gap moves into what we call the solution analysis phase and the business case analysis phase. And this is where another group within s and looks at possible solutions that may exist. Um, and if not, what kind of R&D might be out there at a basic level that we should consider when we're thinking about a project. The business case analysis looks at costs. So these all work together to set the platform for a potential project. At this point, once these analyses are complete, the PFM, the portfolio manager, hands off the responsibility to a program manager. The program manager will work towards project initiation and possibly execution. The portfolio manager stays engaged as well as the component throughout this process. So we work as a matrix team. And once we get the appropriate approvals, then a project can be initiated. So it's important that PF, that uh, portfolio managers uh, work as a team. So there are about eight or nine portfolio managers, which work with the components, the 12 components that John had listed on his slide. As he said, we are um, very 
keen to make sure that we understand each other's requirements because quite often you will have overlap of requirements. Take for example, uh, the CB area, the chem bio area, a lot of components have needs in that area. So cross fertilization is critical. Finally, the PFMs or the portfolio managers get to use their technical expertise and network to work with PMs, bringing emerging technologies to the complementary R&D activities to ensure we are funding the most scientifically relevant research and to reduce redundancy with other government agencies. Portfolio managers spend a great deal of time networking with uh, their cohorts in other government agencies, DOD, USDA, as an example. Thanks for the opportunity to describe that, Greg. Great, thanks, Angela. We're very well said. So to get us started, I wanna circle back to this customer engagement aspect that John was talking about and how we get our requirements or the demand signals from our customers. Angela, could you talk about the different organizations and entities that we engage with? Um, you named a couple of components already, but which ones do you specifically work with? And do we also get demand signals from any other groups besides components? Yes, yes, of course we do. As I mentioned, uh, the chem bio rad area of CBR and thread is huge. Uh, uh, and applicable to many of the different components that were listed on John's previous slide. My particular co component that I work with regularly is the CWMD office, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction. That's my assigned component. How it, it shouldn't be any surprise, however, that I also work with Secret Service, TSA, CBP, U.S. Coast Guard, the first responder community, um, CISA, so many, many, I probably work touch point almost all of the components, 12 components that John had listed on his slide. So remember that we are, s and is the uh, research arm, the R&D arm for DHS. So our components come to us with their requirements and we you know, use our s and dollars to try to come, with, come up with solutions to help their operational missions. We also will get some um, requests from Congress. I think John mentioned this as well, the Hill, the Secretary of D uh, DHS, and we work closely with DOD, DOJ, EPA uh, to reduce the redundancies across the federal government. So we often have joint projects so that we can pull our funding together since we're working towards the same end. The demand signals are plentiful and we always look for overlap so that we can satisfy more customer needs. Great, thank you. Now, yeah. you both have a role in setting the priorities for DHS s and because of your engagement with our customers and partners. Could you each take a second to talk about how your groups collaborate to identify and prioritize those requirements? And John, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. I mean, and I mentioned earlier that you know, the, the component priorities are absolutely critical and key. Um, as Angela mentioned, that's why we have individual integrated product teams with those individual components. Um, and we actually have charters set up with them. And it's critical that we have identified uh, individuals and, and entities within those organizations that can speak on their behalf. Um, because right now, what we don't wanna do is tell the customers what their priorities are. That's not our job. So it, it is their side to tell us what their one to end list is. Um, and that's why we established these IPTs. And so Angela is a portfolio manager and has a counterpart that she works with on a regular basis. And we also have senior executives counterparts on both sides of the organization to ensure that we have a strategic oversight. And, um, and those priority lists that come from the components, again, it, the components establish their own internal priority methods and methodologies. When we collect those needs and those priorities, I mentioned earlier too, that we do, uh, we want to ensure that we're making and investing uh, and meeting the goals and priorities of the components, but we're also looking at it from a, a Homeland Security Enterprise perspective. For example, if I see a number five, um, you know, we'll say, you know, five, uh, a number five priority from TSA and a number eight priority from Coast Guard on biometrics and a number six priority from Secret Service on biometrics. We're going to invest in biometrics because it's cross component. 
And it also enables uh, uh, other components to take advantage of those R&D investments for their own internal uses as well. And it level sets the state of technology so that we don't have a mismatch of an obsolete capability here versus you know, something that is uh, uh, more high end. Um, so, and again, the Hill plays an important role in priorities. So does the administration. Um, those also impact as well. And Angela mentioned the S1. I do wanna throw something out there too though. Those are the requirements pull aspect of s &T. We also have a tech push aspect of s &T, where um, I mentioned earlier, our tech centers, our national labs, um, some of our SBIR programs, those are looking at innovative and enduring capabilities. So yes, we're collecting some of those long-term needs, but we're also scanning the market to look over the horizon. And those are areas where we engage with industry on their thoughts, their ideas. So that's another aspect and angle that we, we haven't really discussed. Uh, but you know, there is a tech, tech push aspect of s and as well. Thank you. Great, thanks. Good information. Angela, would you like to add anything on the cross collaboration uh, within s and I think really uh, John hit it on the head with the IPT. These are our groups that allow us to increase transparency with our components or our customers. I think that's critical. Uh, we've also, uh, s and has undergone some changes and we're working in more of a matrix environment. This increases transparency amongst all the various groups within s and And so these things coming together will allow us to be more confident about the requirements we pull in and of course, the push that, he, that John just mentioned is also a critical piece, but will allow us to get solutions to our components and our customers faster and more efficiently. Great, thanks. So I think this is a good opportunity to bring up how you engage with industry partnerships in the ways that we connect and turn those needs into solicitations and other funding opportunities. Um, for the audience, if you've participated in other industry outreach events, you know that Office of the Industry Partnership Mission is to engage with the private sector so we can tap into their innovative ideas uh, and address R and address R and D needs. Um, so the processes that John and Angela outlined, uh, as gaps come in and go through the decomposition, through solutions approach analysis, business case analysis, and into execution. Um, during that process, OIP is notified and consulted throughout. So we have an idea of what kind of gaps are coming in, what they may look like, and what the you know best target industry audience may be to fulfill those needs. Uh, we really see our input beginning at the project pitch phase and supporting the program managers just prior to execution. Um, but our input and what they're doing is really building on what John and Angela have already accomplished throughout this business process flow. Um, so John, another thing you mentioned earlier is emerging threats. I know our customers come and talk to us about their challenges but how do we go back to them um, and discuss what we're seeing in terms of emerging threats and, and kill, helping keep them aware? Yeah, I mean, uh, so Counter US is a perfect example. Um, and I wanna go back about six years. Uh, this is an area, again, it was a tech push effort and we never, we never had a requirement for Counter UAS about six years ago. This was something that s and you know, uh, did some internal analysis and working with our, our uh, partners from across federal government entities and said, hey, this is coming to a theater near you. And so we initiated a lot of that R&D early on. And so that now we're at a, uh, a, a phase in the program where, you know, we're identifying those capabilities for components to make those procurements and those requisitions. Uh, so, and, and but the, the critical piece of that is that we engage with the components throughout this, uh, through the development, because right now the components don't want to procure something if it doesn't work. And it's hard for them to wedge money in the out years. Um, and you know, so we have to ensure that the capability will meet their needs uh, before anything's transitioned to them. Another area that I would say is uh, the COVID-19 situation. You know, um, we invested in our, 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 uh, our, our labs, our biological labs to, you know, assist with these, uh, these areas. And because we had those enduring capabilities, we were able to respond quickly. Um, so it, it's still critical, no matter what you do, if we have a tech push item, we have to communicate that with the customers, because at the end of the day, 
you know, they will have to be the ones to transition to capability. However, I do, you know, there is one caveat there. s and we do have internal capabilities through our labs and our tech centers as well. So some of those, those items do transition internally. Um, and that's why it's critical for us to, to engage with industry as well as other partners about some of those future threats that we all need to be prepared for. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Angela if she has anything else to add. Uh, the only thing I might add is that we are working hard to also look at long-term strategies. So asking our components questions like, what keeps you up at night? Or where would you want to be in 10, see in 10 years? So in addition to addressing needs that we have right now, we're also exploring that the outreach, the out word uh, year space. It's important to kind of prep up. And I want to make a pl I want to put in a plug for our tech centers. In our tech centers, as part of our matrix partner, we have subject matter experts. These are experts in the, their given field, as well as uh, science advisors, senior science advisors that we leverage quite heavily uh, to help us not only um, you know work out the gaps and and fill in some of the technology that might be missing, but keep an eye on these emerging areas so that we're not blindsided, right? We want to try to be, be best prepared for the unknown, as hard as that is. So that's that's just a little little plug for the uh, TCD folks who are critical. Yeah, perfect. Great. And I think the message is, you know, we're very engaged with industry. It's not a one-way street where we're just accepting gaps and going and doing work, but we're very engaged in having those conversations and trying to understand what the future Absolutely. of threats may look like as well. Yep. So John, Angela, thank you for participating today. I think we provide thank a lot you. of great information for our audience today. Um, I'll now turn it over to Angela as she's going to discuss some highlights of her customer collaborations. Angela? Can I have the slides, please? Thank you, Greg. Okay. Um, again, I'm Angela Irvin. I am the s and CWMD Portfolio Manager. I'm happy to have with me today two representatives from the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office who will uh, give a little bit of, provide input to the discussion in, in a little bit. So next slide, please. So I think we've covered this, but I'm just going to do this one, use this one graphic to give you a picture of the process from customer needs through project execution. And what I wanna point out that really isn't shown on this slide, and I wish I had put it on the slide, I apologize for that, but the matrix partners that make this happen it, they're critical. There are num a number of groups within s and and the components which work to take in our customer needs, to decompose those needs into gaps that are well flushed out and validate that gap with the customer. So we go back and we say, this is what we think the gap is. These are the performance parameters and the metrics. Do you agree? Then the solution analysis team and looks at possible solutions and the funding is evaluated. And again, within this process, we do engage the customer to say, these are our solutions that we have found, which is preferred. There could be more than one approach that's preferred, that's fine. So we'll talk about that. Then the program manager starts with the project planning, uh, approvals associated with initiation of the project, resourcing execution. And again, I remind us all that this is done in a matrix. This is done as a team, not in a vacuum. Things aren't pushed over the side. And then the portfolio manager, for example, goes off and does something else. They stay engaged in this process. Our subject matter act, uh, experts are engaged this, in this process as well. So this is just a nice graphic to keep the overall model in place in, in, in your mind. Next slide, please. So some successful collaborations that have come out of uh, interactions with CWMD, with groups from groups, R&D groups within s and We, um, I think John mentioned, our biological labs 
being a very important part of what we do. They, they also, uh, the group within Panther was responsible for risk assessments uh, to BD21. BD21 program is a CWMD acquisition program. And if John or Marissa, when, when they uh, talk, if they wanna to speak to that, I'll let them, but it's a major acquisition. So we supported that by providing assessments of uh, biological threats. We also did a work, a lot of work Panther did and MBAC in the laboratory, uh, securing laboratory data on decay rates and decomposition with respect to the SARS COVID, uh, the COVID SARS virus. So we had, we had a, a, a lot of contribution here. And in fact, I don't know if many folks remember our acting um, undersecretary at the time gave a presentation at one of President Trump's weekly briefings or daily briefings on the SARS. So that is, this data came from the group that is within s and and working with NBAC. We have established this CWMD R&D coordination IPT. Uh, this has been critical uh, to initiate collaboration with this office. I think we've done a lot of work in the last year, year and a half. And I'm excited to be able to announce Mar Marissa Giles. Marissa is the R&D branch chief from CWMD. And I'd like to get her perspective on what she sees this newly formed IPT executing uh, and her feelings on the collaborations that have been happening over the year and, and a half and, and what we're all looking forward to in the near future. So Marissa, over to you. Yep. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, so as Angela said, my name is Marissa Giles. I'm the branch chief with the Research and Development Division at CWMD. So yes, I did say research and development. So just for just to make sure everybody's on the same page, CWMD is this very unique office within DHS where we, we do conduct research and development. We also gather requirements from operators and we also have procurement funding for acquisitions. So it's incredibly important that when you have two offices in DHS that are conducting research and development, that those two offices coordinate with each other to make sure that we're addressing the requirements from the components in the appropriate way with the limited resources that we have, that we're not duplicating worth, excuse me, duplicating work, and that we're also leveraging each other's resources. So that really is the objective of this IPT is to bring the, the two offices together to make sure that we're executing our R&D investments wisely. <laughs> Um, this, this is really exciting. Uh, it's, 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 there's already been a lot of co coordination between the two groups, even before this IPT was stood up, as you heard Angela mention, you know, I think for the future there, this, this will just continue to grow. I, I believe that there will be a lot of areas in the CBR and space where the two groups will continue to invest. You've you heard about this on the BD21, but I, I, this will come up with chemical detection, I'm sure in the near future as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is vital. It's a, it's a key part of what we do um, to support the DHS operators. Uh, you know, it's really important that we have our finger on the button of these emerging technology needs to address these emerging threats um, in, in order to support the operators. So Angela, with that, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Next slide, please. Some other successful collaborations uh, in terms of supporting BD21, many, uh, several SMEs, subject matter experts within s and contributed to what is known as an operational requirements document. This is part of the acquisition cycle. It's one of the, it's an important document, which is re uh, required to move forward. And so there was a lot of time spent on assisting in that development of that document critical testing event, which is coming up in October, s and is holding their urban transport dispersion testing event in New York City. And we're partnering with many agencies, one of which is the uh, CWMD and the BD21 program. If you want to know more about this, uh, please reach out to me, but this is a significant event where we're going to release uh, bio simulants and chem simulants, and we're going to track the spread underground in a subway and above. So a uh, major, major uh, event for many organizations, but in particular, s and has spent a lot of time on the development, uh, getting ready for this event. 
finally, we are ramping up our activities in the Fab D research development testing area. And uh, we have an evaluation plan that is joint between CWMD and s and And so this is exciting for us. I think these, these are some of the copies of the reports I'm talking about on this slide. This is exciting for us because this is an important area uh, to, for animal research, and we're looking forward to being able to execute more in this particular area. Next slide, please. In the future, we're looking at several things. And again, this is a matrix uh, uh, activity. This is multi-government activity. We are looking at developing detectors that can do more than one thing. So they have more than one function. So whenever I talk about this particular program, I like to say the tricorder that we all know from Star Trek. Of course, that is a pipe dream. That's very difficult, maybe someday, but we have to work towards that, that end game. So we, have, we will be working there. We will be looking at field deployable biological detectors. We will be looking at wide area surveillance systems, um, standoff systems, uh, data analytics, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. These are all things that will be seeing some more active research over the next several years. And finally, the near term, we will be looking at risk assessments for the food and ag uh, sector, food supply chain, this sort of thing. So these are some of our future activities. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, that, that was my last slide, obviously. When, now what I would like to do is invite John Toddy to speak. John is the Director of Requirements in CWMD. And I'd like to hear from John, give us some perspective on this new coordination in IPT and maybe some thoughts on improvements you have seen between the two organizations over the last uh, year or two. Sure. Thank you, Angela, for the opportunity. Um, so when, when we embarked on our revision to the requirements process, we wanted to really keep in mind the operational end user. And we wanted to create a process that was relatively easy for them to use. Uh, we didn't want our requirements generation process to be burdensome. So uh, we, we threw together a uh, a templated form that any one of our operational component partners could use at any time throughout the course of the year to write down a capability gap that they have within their component organization. Um, and we really wanted them to focus those on, hey, what's the capability gap without trying to derive and tell us a preordained solution to fill those capability gaps. So over the course of the last two years, we've had quite a lot of success in getting capability gaps from our component partners through this process, really over the, the continuous calendar year. Um, in turn, we take those capability gaps and we have a prioritization working group that we have established, which is made up of all of our component partners uh, and annually in the lead up to the budget build, we prioritize all the capability gaps that we have uh, currently on file that are not closed out, that uh, are things that need to be addressed. Um, once we get the prioritization list, uh, we look for what are the solution courses of action that we should be able to take in order to close those gaps. Is this a training solution that could help close the gap? Is there a uh, research and development uh, need for something that we probably know doesn't exist. Can we work with our rapid capabilities division to work for a commercial off the shelf solution? Um, so we go through kind of the dot mill FP options that we have in front of us to try to close those gaps. Now where s and and the, the partnership comes in, since we have our own R&D group that uh, Marissa alluded to, we first work through our research and development uh, team within CWMD to say, 
hey, we have a need here. We, we can't fill this with a rapid capability, something off the shelf that either DOD has or, or industry has already built. Um, and we worked through Angela to s and and through the IPT to coordinate how we can get this thing in the right place for a solution development and leverage the expertise, the connections and the skills that may reside within either the R&D or s and to, to best handle and address those capability gaps that we have. And uh, we've been really successful so far in starting to funnel those things to the right place so that they can be worked on uh, by the best people to take on those, those uh, capability gaps. And I'll, I'll pause there and uh, see if there's any follow-up, Angela, over. Thank you, John. Actually, I have follow-up in that CWMD is unique in that it is an R&D organization, just like we are, s and and you did institute, a you do have a requirements pull process. We are planning to take the output from your process into our IPT so that things that CWMD R&D may not want to tackle could be considered for s &T. So this is unique for CWMD being one of the R&D organizations. I think there's only six or so DHS components that are have R&D funding. So this is, this is even more critical for us. And we, and we have two streams of funding, if you will, to tap into. So thanks for bringing that up. I had failed to mention that. Okay, Greg, I, and I, unless there's any questions, uh, I'm think back to you. Okay, Angela, I, I'm gonna, you, you get to throw it over to me uh, fat, real okay. fast, but um, we're gonna move into Q&A in just a minute here. And so I'm gonna invite John McEntee back on as well. Um, we, before we do that, and we do wanna give people the opportunity um, to put their slide or to, yeah, we'll have the slides up on screen in just a second, um, but we do wanna give people the opportunity to put their questions in the, in the Q&A chat box. Um, so I just wanna really quickly go over a few resources um, that we've discussed today. Um, and I'm, I'm, I might actually have uh, uh, John, John McEntee talk about the first one, but we'll circle back to that. Um, the uh, the second resource that we have here, and you know, we certainly want for our participants and the attendees today to connect with us. You know, there is somebody that is always on the other side of an email here. Um, that second email, the DHS uh, CWMD Industry Engagement Team. Um, I'll put these uh, links in the chat and then these emails in the chat in just a second. Um, but the CWMD Industry Engagement Team can help coordinate a meeting with. Uh, vendors to permit to present technologies to CWMD. So, you know, that uh, if you are a member of industry and you want to talk to CWMD, that's one of the, you know, that's the email for you. Um, scrolling down to that next work with s &T website. Well, that's how, you know, at DHS s &T, um, that's how you can find out a lot about how to work with us. Um, everything from our innovation pro funding programs and our commercialization um, opportunities as well. Um, another thing to note, that industry outreach form, uh, where you'll see kind of in the bottom right of the screen there, um, we would love to hear about your technologies, DHS s &T. This is our um, form for you. Um, so if you actually fill that out and then send it back to us, um, we are more than happy to uh, engage with you um, and you know, get connected that way. Um, John, I do know that we were going to mention the Actually, John McEntee, not John Toddy. Uh, but yeah, so John McEntee, we were gonna mention the s and technology scouting as well. So I, I don't know if you just have a quick word to say about that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the mechanisms in which we, we, we scan the market for technological states and maturity. Um, and so, you know, part of their, their positions and roles in, in um, not just s and but the department, because we get, a lot of re requests across from components is that they have a you know if you remember this something that was called a rolodex so essentially they have a database that they help 
um, that they help to manage and scan whenever we have a requirement that comes in to, from a component or another uh, priority. Um, they, we typically send it to them and they do the scanning. So the more they know, the better informed that we are. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to them um, with uh, not just with uh, anything that you might have that they could, they could store in a database, but if you have any particular technological capabilities or solution sets. And I encourage you to, to really take a look at this slide that Connie mentioned. Again, we, we have a lot of solicitations out there, a lot of great ideas for the long range BAA, SBIRs and other uh, solicitations. So really keep an eye on that. They change throughout the year. If you look at it now, it's gonna be different, you know, several months from now. So just, I, I would recommend you, you keep that um, on your radar. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, John. That actually brings me to another point. If you do fill out our industry and outreach form, we'll add you to our mailing list so that you can find out about just what John had talked about, our SBIR opportunities, you know, new funding opportunities, events, ways to engage with us. Um, so, you know, that's certainly a great resource for people as well. Um, I'll be putting uh, one of the last uh, links in the chat here in just a second. Um, and I do want to mention, I, I know that we have received a few questions about, hey, how do I start to get connected um, with DHS s &T? Well, I am going to put our DHS s and um, and innovation email um, into the chat box here. Um, there is somebody on the other end of that email, and we are happy to engage with um, anybody and direct your questions as well. And with that, I'm gonna actually gonna direct some questions over to our fantastic panelists here. So um, now John and Angela, I think that this first question is uh, gonna be geared towards you. So how do you deal with requirements that come in from different parts of the same component, which may appear um, incongruent or not in alignment? Angela, you want me to take this one? Yeah, well, I can tell you what I would do as a portfolio manager. Um, I get to the bottom of why they are, uh, as as you said, incongruent. Uh, that is not actually uncommon, uh, you know, and the IPTs uh, will help with this, obviously, because if we funnel everything through the IPTs, then there will be votes for the voting members in the IPT. But, uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to require a little bit of what's going on here by the portfolio manager to get to the source and and pull everything into the IPT and then fix that seemingly incongruent issue. Oftentimes it really is not as it appears, they might want something very similar, it's just asked in a different way and it appears to be incongruent. So it takes some sleuthing. John, would you like to add? That's why we have the IPTs, right? Um, and that's why, you know, when we established the IPTs, we, we went to the number one, you know, uh, individual in that organization and say, who can represent your priorities? So if we get, you know, a requirement from a different part of the organization, again, we have to respectfully honor the IPT charters we have in place. That component selected a specific office that handles their priorities. So we would typically, you know, um, um, you know, push them in the direction of their own agency's priorities because everybody, you know, you know, there's new people coming on board all the time. And so the IPTs, that's why they're there. They established one voice and one set of priorities. Um, and we, we have to respectfully climb because sometimes we can't have five different priority lists for one component. I mean, it, it's too, we can't prioritize that. The components have to do that. Um, so, so everything Angela said, spot on. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much for that. Um, and I do want to note we are getting a lot of questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, so just uh, note that in the chat, we do have that S&T Innovation mailbox. So if we don't get to your question today, we will follow up with you at another time if you have a question. Um, but with that, I am going to move on to CWMD. This is a question for um, John or Marissa. So what mechanisms does DHS use to get a pulse on what industry can offer in niche areas that are unique to Homeland Security? So it's kind of an extended one. I'll let you take that. 
Uh, John, I can take that. Yeah, so I mean, you, you heard some of the mechanisms already mentioned by uh, my s &T colleagues, uh, you know, solicitations, RFIs, things like that. But, you know, for small businesses that are just starting out and that are just getting their feet wet, for example, you know, I, I know it can be really, really hard for them to just get their foot in the door to say, hey, look at all the great stuff we've been working on. And DHS, s &T, and CWMD manage a phenomenal cyber program. So uh, the, I, I think we've done a really good job working as, as two components, working under one program, one umbrella, and doing outreach events to small businesses, road tours, things like that. Um, program managers on the CWMD side, I'm pretty sure on the s and side as well, we are scientists and engineers and we're just naturally curious and are going to want to know what's going on. So we will attend scientific and technical conferences, which will have industry expos. So we'll go rub shoulders with folks who are working on these really great technologies that we just may not be aware of as part of market research. Uh, we will also get word of other government agencies working on, on great technologies for other mission areas, the Department of Defense and the Warfighter, for example, that we may not have thought of yet for Homeland Security, but, you know, it's, it's a, that has the potential to be used for that mission space as well. And that will happen through either attending program reviews with the interagency or attending interagency coordination meeting events, or just a simple word of mouth email from our colleagues over in the other agencies. Um, John, do you have anything to add? No, we we uh, we don't connect really like like you do with with industry as much. Uh, you know, we're we're focused on the components and uh, making sure that they have the means to funnel their requests through us, and then we kind of turn that over to you for the the COA development. So you, you got it. Thanks. Okay. All right, and so then Greg, this next one is for you. Um, this is on unsolicited uh, proposals and technologies. Um, so what if I have a white paper on a technology or a proposal for a technology? Um, what, what does DHS or DHS s and do with that? Yeah, so the first thing I would do is encourage you to go with that working with DHS s and website. Um, that's where you'll find listing of all current open solicitations and um, areas of R&D that we're, we're looking for. If, if there's nothing on that site anywhere um, that is relevant to your technology, then you can consider submitting your capability through the DHS unsolicited proposal process. Um, this is kind of unique in that it's for innovative products and services that aren't commercially available. And there are some very specific criteria that must be met um, before unsolicited proposals can be submitted. Um, but when they are, and if it meets all of that criteria, then we filter down to the correct portfolio manager or program manager um, to review uh, and identify whether there's something s and wants to pursue or not. Um, and I believe we can add the website for the unsolicited proposals to the chat so that everyone can have access to that. Yes, I can do that. Okay, that website is now in the chat. Okay. All right, so a few more questions then for our panelists. Uh, so John and Angela, this goes to you. Um, how do you help com a component with an emerging technology or R&D need? Are there instances when you accelerate the process for rapid and emergent needs? Sure. Angela, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the first crack at this and you know, you tie it up. Um, so, we have to be responsive. And so we do have accelerated processes, especially for those, you know, one year efforts that are, you know, below a certain threshold. But the again, it goes back to the component. You know, if it's a priority for a component, we have a long list that's in our process. If this is emerging and takes the cake, then we have to move that one up in priority and pause maybe some other ones. Again, you know, we have lists that go beyond our resources and we do that for a reason. We have those longer lists to one, justify additional funding, but we also use that list to feed out your efforts and projects. Um, but yes, we have mechanisms that kind of fast track, you know, those high priority items, especially if, you know, as I mentioned, if they're a lower uh, uh, dollar threshold and time period. But if they're a multi-year, a multi-million dollar efforts, 
you know, we, we have to put some due diligence into that. Um, but again, if a component has a priority for it, we'll put that one as our number one to move through the process. Um, so uh, we, we can make those adjustments. And then Angela, uh, did I miss anything? Well, I can provide two specific examples. Uh, COVID, um, where we immediately set up a tiger team within s &T. And then uh, the principals of that tiger team were out doing outreach to the appropriate other agencies. Secondly, the African swine fever is a big issue right now in spreading in Hades in the Dominican Republic. So we have now set up a tiger team with respect to that issue. And we do coordinate with the appropriate USDA and other offices. Uh, I don't, you know, I know that they meet regularly. And so we don't do this in a vacuum. There's a lot of uh, expertise out there that we need to make part of the team. So those are two examples where we had to move quickly to address uh, the action what was going on and try to provide expertise there. So. Okay. All right, thank you all so much. Uh, so I think that we're, we just have, um, one last question um, in from the audience. I know we're one last question for at least today. I know that we're coming up on time. So um, again, please send us a, if you do have a question, we can certainly route it through the right folks. Um, uh, but this one um, is potentially for um, John, Angela and CWMD. Um, does uh, does s and or s and and CWMD um, ever interface with other uh, government um, R&D offices, um, other agencies to, you know, work and develop out um, I, uh, IPTs or requirements or something? So oh, I'll jump in on that. And I think Marissa and John uh, as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have, in fact, groups that, uh, multiple groups, working groups. One in particular I'm thinking of is called the CWMD Alliance where we have joint projects between DOD, JPEO, CWMD, and s &T. And this is just one of several groups. Uh, it's really a smaller community than one might think in certain areas. So we pretty much know what's going on across uh, you know, DOD, be it the Army or Navy, uh, Marine Corps. We have a sense of the R&D and uh, talk often with our colleagues. John, Marissa, kick it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Angela. Yeah, it's it's um and just so everybody knows, it's not just a matter of us just sitting down and you know exchanging quad charts or talking with each other. We will jointly fund R and D efforts. So you know we all have very limited resources and limited budgets, and it's it's good if we can team together to to hit off these really high priority emerging areas because you know what's a what more often than not, what's a high priority for DHS is going to be a priority for another government agency. So it's really important that across the government, we all coordinate on R&D as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. And that we are at 2.59 Eastern time. So I think that that actually brings us to, to, us to time. So I, I do want to thank everyone for joining us today, especially our panelists. We really appreciate you coming on here and talking about the collaborative work that you do. So John and John, uh, Marissa, Angela, Greg, thank you so much. I think I'm gonna go over one last slide, um, just letting people know about some, um, some other opportunities that DHS s &T has. Um, so as you will see here, um, there are two opportunities that we would actually like to draw your attention to. The one on the left is the Cooling Solutions Prize Challenge. Um, this prize challenge was uh, recently um, announced and uh, that challenge is looking for climate friendly cooling solutions that the public can access in the event of an extreme heat event. So we definitely encourage you to look at that. Um, we definitely encourage you to go to the prize competitions website, which I'm putting in the chat right now, plenty of links for everybody. Um, and then the second one, uh, keep your eyes peeled for the next Insights Outreach webinar that's going to be on Tuesday, November 2nd. Um, we definitely hope to see you uh, next month. 
We'll be sending out more information about that shortly. So either you can go to the link that I'm about to put in the chat again, um, or we'll try and send you an email. So um, thanks everybody for joining today and we hope to see you next month.